Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending again our webinar series. Uh, this is our second for the year, and uh, we're certainly very excited to be able to present uh, these and continue to present these um, as one of those pivotal, uh, pivoting things that we, uh, we've done uh, from last year's uh, interesting year. So once again, Phil and I are going to sort of do it in a bit of a fireside chat sort of manner. Um, although obviously with a little bit more uh, structure because we've got some slides to throw in there as well. Uh, so for those who don't know, my name is Ashley Shield. I'm one of the executive directors uh, of Dion Reed and I'm based in our Melbourne office. And I have Phil Hemenko with me, who is our national compliance manager, who's based up in our Queensland office. Uh, so we'll have a bit of a chat, we'll run through. There will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so please feel free to make some notes and then uh, ask Phil as many questions as you like when we're all over. So I'll hand over to Phil and uh, we can start the process. Thanks. We didn't get any questions this morning, Ashley, from our morning session. So I was feeling a bit disappointed. So hoping our, uh, our crowd here come up with something to put you on the hot seat this afternoon. Put you on the hot seat, Phil. So Ash, today, as you said, we're going to look at a case study of a real life De Reed client and only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. So in our case study, we're calling this gentleman Virat. And Virat ran a media based business that had traded for some time and had done pretty well in the past. But when the COVID pandemic really hit hard, his cash flow just dried up uh, very quickly. So maybe we should have a bit of a look at what happened to Virat to get him into the position that he ended up in. When cash flow started to get a bit tight, even when he was profitable, things were a little bit tight. Ash, what did Virat do to address that? Yeah, so Phil, it, he um, he was the business had been doing quite well and 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 uh, had been growing nicely, and then with the start of the pandemic, he actually had a really quick. Um, uh, cancelling of orders and all of a sudden his money dried up. So when that sort of happens, what we often see is the first port of call for a director who's playing, um, uh, for a director who's having a look at these things, the very first thing they do is that they start using uh, what I call the Australia's fifth largest bank, which <laughs> is the ATO and the unofficial overdraft that unfortunately uh, exists for a lot of businesses. So um, he'd start sort of putting off making those payments to the ATO and using that money to keep his creditors happy. Yeah. So the unofficial overdraft, the one that the ATO don't want businesses to have, uh, apparently last year it grew by $7 billion uh, just in the one year. So people did start using that overdraft pretty hard and Virat was one of those. Yep. Now, it's pretty common that people do it. You and I see it all the time. But sooner or later, the tax man's going to come looking for his money. Can you give us any insights into how long that might take for the ATA to come knocking, Ash? <laughs> well, oh, sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but um, having a government department determine a time frame and, and having a process that's consistent um, in itself is a bit is a bit interesting. So, yeah. look, the reality is um, we have never been able to gauge a specific timeline. I've had clients come in. Um, who haven't heard from the ATO in three years, and I've had others who have only been, you know, have been behind for a week, and they've had some pressure. Um, so, there, unfortunately, there there is a process, but that process can be very quick or very slow, just on where you sit in the pile. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's no doubt that they're going to start building up a bit of pace. But again, they're going to have a lot of files to deal with, so we can't predict the speed that they're going to happen. We just do know that at some point they will. Yeah, so the size of the debt's not really an indicator. How long it's been behind is not really an indicator. So if you've got a client out there that's got ATO debt, you really can't predict when the ATO might start chasing that up. No. What I'd say is that with the government departments, sometimes the wheels turn very slowly on occasions, but they are turning. And sooner or later, that file's going to get to the top of the pile and your client's going to get a, a message or a call from the ATO. Yep. Now, obviously, what's important, I think, to our audience today is what does that mean for their clients? What does that mean for company directors where the company has tax arrears? Mm -hmm. Could you just talk through some of those issues and maybe tell us a little bit about what's called a director's penalty notice, Ashley? 
Yeah, well, by, by far, um, we see that as probably one of the biggest risks, particularly for directors personally and the impact through. So I think we, we mentioned in our last webinar for those who are here um, that the director penalty notice regime has now extended to include GST, wine equalisation tax and luxury car tax. Mm -hmm. So um, so that extension now picks up a large chunk of, of what is accruing debt on a... Uh, on a, on a quarterly or monthly basis. So the, and I think DPNs are an odd little beast. It's a way of ensuring that directors um, uh, take a little bit more personal responsibility around that debt. Uh, because in the past, it's been one of those ones that's been let go because there has been no personal recourse through uh, on, on a lot of the tax. Mm. So director penalty notices, um, one of the issues with direct penalty notices is that they actually come about uh, in different ways for different parts of the debt. So if you look at superannuation, for instance, Phil, um, superannuation, if you don't pay the debt on the day it's due, then the, um, you must lodge the superannuation guarantee charge form on the day that you would have paid the money otherwise. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the director automatically becomes personally liable for that debt under what they call a lockdown director penalty notice. And I'll, I'll go into the differences in a second. Mm. For most of the other debts, so um, uh, now GST and PAYG, it's the timing of it is matched around when the, the lodgements are due. So if your BAS is due on the 21st of a month, uh, if you have not lodged the business activity statement within three months of its due date, then the director becomes automatically liable under the lockdown DPN. Right. Now, they brought in this lockdown um, scenario to avoid people who just didn't bother to lodge. Yeah. And if they didn't, you know, the old theory was if you didn't tell the ATO what debt you owed them, they didn't know, so therefore they couldn't chase you. So they used this lockdown as a method to try and bring that into at least give them a sporting chance to chase their own debt. Um, so... Uh, if, if it is a lockdown because of late lodgement, then the director can't do anything to get out of it and they're personally liable for it. If they are lodging on time, then they get a sporting chance. Hmm. So the ATO can issue with a director penalty notice, which gives the director 21 days from the date of the letter. And I think it's important to understand it's from the date of the letter, not the date it's received. Yeah. Because under the current mailing system, we lose three to four days uh, quite regularly for a director by the time they find out about it. In that remaining time, they've got um, three choices. One is to either pay it, uh, one is to enter into voluntary administration or to enter into liquidation. Mm -hmm. And if they enter into uh, paying it, obviously solves the problem. Uh, but if they enter into one of the other two, then they're not automatically made liable for it if they do it within the 21 day period. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's important if you get a director's penalty notice to move really quick because you, you run out of time very, very fast. Um, the other trick that's come out, and I say it's only recently come out, but if you ignore 2020 or 2020, um, the, in, in 2019, the ATO changed the way they send the letters out for director penalty notices and they actually merge both the lockdown and non-lockdown component. So unless you read it really carefully, you could have a non-lockdown component that looks like it's locked down and vice versa. And then, you know, you might think that you've got more time to make a decision than you actually have. Mm. So just something to watch now with the new forms that come out. Um, and the other trick for that um, is that the ATO only has to write to the director at the address that's on their ASIC form. That is deemed to be a legitimate address, even if the director's moved. And that's now in case law that that doesn't, that, that doesn't help them. So director, for us, anyone who uses the ATO as an overdraft, um, one of the really big risks at the moment is, is this new, is the director penalties and what can happen with that. And a couple of traps there, Ashley. I know from my experience that people understand that they report their PAYG through their BAS, but they often overlook the need to lodge that SGC form by the due date. And it's um, also a lot of accountants make sure that the, the company has the correct registered business office 
but unless you update the residential address for the director, that notice could go somewhere else, but it's still deemed to be served. That's it. And I just say as an aside that it's not true that uh, nobody at the ATA has got a sense of humour because they made that change on the 1st of April. <laughs> uh, the, last, the last two big changes that they made to tax laws or laws that affected these things were both done on the 1st of April. So someone down there is having a bit of a giggle. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so there's an important message for directors there that even if they're not in a position to pay the amounts that they owe in those various taxes, if they at least lodge their reports within the prescribed timeframes, they have the opportunity to avoid that penalty becoming a lockdown and they've got the chance to at least deal with their liability. That's it. They've got a chance. Yep. Yeah. Now, for us, in, in my opinion, arrears with the ATO is often the first and the most visible sign that a business is experiencing some sort of financial distress. Mm. So Virat ended up in arrears with the ATO, and at some point they're going to start chasing him for payment. Right. Mm. So we've spoken about what, what sort of things can he look at doing there, Ashley? What did he do when they came knocking him? Well, in, in this case, Phil, um, they, they didn't actually come knocking straight away because um, obviously we had some, uh, because of all the COVID stuff and the timing yeah. and all of that. Mm. However, he was worried and wanted to do the right thing. So one of the things he then went to was a, a debtor finance facility. Right. So he was still, at, he did have a lot of work in the, in the he had a lot of work comparatively in, in, the, in the facility. Um, so been able to bring his cash payments forward and to control the timing of it. Uh, so one of the things that he did, he put a debtor finance facility in place. Mm -hmm. That then brought forward his ability to get the cash out of his debtor book. So I'd moved from uh, uh, put put cash in the bank effectively out of the uh, another part of the asset of the balance sheet. Um, so that and the other big benefit of debt of finance, particularly in a business that is growing, is that you control your cash. You know when you're going to have cash in the bank to pay bills. Yeah. So by having the debt of finance facility, he was able to start managing payment plans with the ATO, which he did put in place. Um, uh, and then but, and also to keep managing the creditors that he had at the time. The problem with debt of finance, in, and this is what happened with Virat, was that he, although he put it in place at the, in theory, at the right time, because his business kept going down and more orders being left, his his debtors were starting to dry up. So that facility became less and less available, useful to him. Mm. Um, but you know, it, it is a great if you're a growing business. I can't think of anything better from a working capital point of view. But um, in his case, where we're going the other way, it didn't work so well. Yeah, so if his debtor book starts diminishing because people keep cancelling orders, he's going to run out of cash at some point. Yep. And that's pretty much what happened to Vera. Mm -hmm. But when that happened to him, what did he what did he try to do next? Well, and for anyone who knows me, Phil, this is one of my pet peeves and, and uh, one of the real things that I dislike uh, that's come into the market is that he started turning to fintechs. Ah. Now... I, and I say that carefully because there are people even on here today that I can see that uh, that are in the fintech game and fintech is a good product for the right person. But Absolutely. in his case, in a diminishing business, um, going online and getting a fintech loan didn't wasn't wasn't the smart thing. So for those who don't know, fintech's obviously just an acronym for financial and technology, and really what they are. Uh, loans that you apply for online and they don't ask for financials a lot of the time. They don't ask for um, any of the normal reporting stuff that you would have to get from your accountant. What they do is that they ask for access to your main business account and they use algorithms to actually determine how much they can lend to you based on what you can afford to pay back based on what cash is coming into the company. Um, so, in a, again, in a situation like this, the, the past of his bank account looked a lot better than what the future did. Mm. So, um, so he was able to get a reasonable loan from a fintech, which then put cash in his bank account to allow him then to continue to play um, and to use that to pay bills and keep his staff employed and things like that. Yeah. So that's... Uh, one of the things about fintechs, though, and this is um, is fintechs. Uh, they often talk about that they are an unsecured loan, and they don't secure against the company, 
But what they do do is that they do have personal guarantees and quite often written into the clauses are caveatable interest charges, mm. not only for the directors, but we've even seen cases, and it wasn't in Virat's case, but in some cases we're actually seeing it uh, that they connect to the shareholders. So you might have the husband only as the director, but then they connect the uh, the shareholders to it as well. Wow. So, and, you know, again, for people who don't know caveats, depending on where you are in the country, because it's a state-based system, um, that will give um, some states the power to, to sell the property and then get their money out of that. And other times it just means that they have to sit there and wait until uh, the owner of the property does sell. Mm. And, and then they can take whatever money is left over at that time. So a very dangerous product, but useful product at the right time. Very well, short term. For me, absolutely. And the, I think the key thing is short term. Mm. That if you've got a, a short term need and you're going to be able to cover that, fintech can be a great way of just smoothing out a cash flow. But when Virat's facing a longer term decline in his sales, he's really using a short term method of funding for a long term need. And fintech can be a bit of a red flag to keep an eye out for because, unfortunately, it is misused by directors. As you said yourself, Ashley, sometimes when, you know, you've got a bill due in a day's time or two days' time and you're on the internet at 10 o'clock at night, uh, you just want some money in your bank account and you may not consider, the director may not consider uh, some of the issues with that. So with Virat, he's effectively put a Band-Aid on it, hasn't he, using fintech? Yeah. Yep. So, so he's used the debt of finance, but his debt has start to dry up. He's got a fintech loan, but you know that money will go quickly when he starts paying his bills. Did he try anything else after that? <laughs> uh, mate, by this stage, the uh, the government had brought in the the new coronavirus small and medium business enterprise guarantee scheme. Right. And the new loans became available. And again, he had a, a good p and l and and looked very good on the marketplace. So he was able to get one of these uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fifty percent guaranteed loans. Mm -hmm. So again, just to put some cash injection in, you know by this stage, he was really struggling for sales and it became more about survival. Mm -hmm. So it was really about trying to keep the staff on, like we see all the time, mate, the um, Small businesses treat their staff like family and yeah. it's amazing what harm a director will put themselves personally in to try and protect that business family. Yeah. Um, and, and we saw that. He, he took on a, uh, one of these government loans. Uh, and again, they're, they're, they're a great product. They're, again, for the right purpose and the right place, it's where they belong. One of the big issues that came up with that, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, was that there are three-year payback. So the, um, once you start paying them back, it's a very expensive payback. Mm. Um, and, so, and that just eats into your cash flow even further. Yeah. So, and, you know, the guarantee loans are great. Government's guaranteeing 50%, but Virat was guaranteeing the whole 100%, which yeah. I think is the part that everyone forgets. Okay. So he's, he's gone there too. He's got the, now he's done the debtor finance and the FinTech loan and the, the SME guaranteed loan. Is there anything else about the background that we should be aware of before we move on and have a look at a few numbers? Yeah, look, Phil, just to um, to round out, uh, I guess, the whole picture is that, you know, he, this was a business that um, he got JobKeeper. Uh, he did receive the cash boost like, you know, every business did. Uh, and that, that was to the tune of about $250,000. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he, it was just... It's one of those things that he was just doing everything he possibly could to keep it alive. You know, and, and a lot of us sat in a, in a world last year where we were just waiting to get out the other side mm. and there was money available to help us get through. Um, and as, as I say quite, quite um, regularly, the, the government, the, and, and I'll talk federal because I know there's a... Uh, there's a lot more fighting at the state level about whether they did a good or bad job. But at the federal level, they did a, you know, they really did a great job of going, let's worry about the health problem this year, and then we'll push the financial out to next year. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of businesses that got a bucket load of cash um, that allowed them just to get through. So, you know, Virat was very much focused on getting to the other side of the COVID pandemic 
so that he could then start making money again. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately for him, he built up an enormous amount of debt along the way. Which he could probably get away with because nobody was really chasing him during the, the COVID period as well. ATO went into hibernation. Uh, landlords, subject to their rules in their particular state, weren't able to take the action that they might normally take. So he had a bit of had a bit of time on his side. Mm -hmm. So um, when we look at Vera, he's tried pretty much everything before he came and saw a pre-insolvency specialist or get any advice at all. Yeah. So what I might do, Ash, is just get you to throw those numbers up on the screen. And how fancy are we? Look at this. Hey, look at Magic. This. Who said you can't teach old dogs new tricks, Ashley? Hey, look at that. Look at that. Hopefully so let's just have a quick let's just have a quick quick talk about Vera. Mm -hmm. And as you can see on the screen, he's got four hundred thousand dollars worth of debtors, and he owes his debtor financier three hundred thousand. He's got motor vehicles worth one hundred and thirty thousand, and they've got one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars finance on them. Vera owes the company some money himself. Uh, that's probably largely a Division 7A loan where he's been taking his money out of the company in the form of a loan. And he's got a little bit of cash at the bank. Now, on the other side of the equation, he's got a loan and an overdraft to a major bank. And we'll talk a little bit about some interesting things about that loan in a minute, Ash. But he has the bank 350. There's his fintech lender in there for 50 grand, the COVID SME loan for 250, and trade creditors for 280. Now, by now, during this COVID period, Virat's ATO debts actually escalated to $800,000. Uh, now, as we said earlier, the ATO's debt book grew by $7 billion during the course of 2020, which is a lot of money, and, and Virat's a bit of that. That's the second overdraft getting used. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, by getting this finance from a variety of sources just to keep things afloat, the company's probably ended up with a lot more debt than it would have done if, he, if he'd acted a little bit sooner. And as you said, you know, he's, he's tried to keep things afloat and business people by nature are, are optimistic and hardworking and passionate people about their businesses. It's really hard running a business. And if you're not like that, you're not going to survive. But that sense of eternal optimism is if I can just keep trading and keep going, somehow things will turn around. You know, and we, we always hope they do, but unfortunately, sometime they don't. Ash, can you just run us through some of the, the key issues that we should consider about when we look at this uh, asset and liability position? Yeah, so um, you know, magic again. Yeah. Um, so I think for, from our point of view, one of the big things that started to happen was that it, the cash flow did improve. Mm -hmm. um, the orders were coming back now that everyone was sort of back out of lockdown and... Uh, so they, they were able to start, uh, the forward orders were looking great, things were, were going in the right direction. Mm. When he sat with us and we sort of talked about options, he, it was very clear though that even though the cash flow was coming back, it was never going to have a chance to meet um, the, the liabilities that had accrued. So that all the various loans and all the, and the repayments, he wasn't going to be able to meet those as and when they fell due. Um, so he certainly, that was a major issue. He was still very passionate about being in the industry and believed that, you know, once he got the break, that he was going to be able to come out the other side. Um, the debtor financier did have an appropriate security over the company and a charge over all the debtors as well as the whole company. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, the major bank didn't. Now, we have no idea why. Uh, their, their loan documents certainly said that they could, mm -hmm. um, but through, um, as it, it turns out, as a, a miracle for Vera Virat in some ways, um, they did not bother putting the charge on the company. So, uh, so that didn't exist at all. Uh, and as we mentioned before, the, the government-backed uh, loan and the fintechs don't normally put a charge on. And in this case, that was exactly what happened. They didn't bother having any company security in place. Mm. So they, um, you yeah, know, and, and he just, he was truly still passionate about the fact that he could, uh, he could turn it around. Yeah, yeah. So as you said, he can't negotiate settlements with his creditors or he couldn't afford, he couldn't afford to put forward any sort of reasonable payment plan. But he does want to stay in the industry. He's still passionate about doing what he's doing and he wants to keep going. What can he do, Ash? What can he do about that situation? 
Yeah, so, um, and again, for those who listened to our last presentation, we talk about all the options there. And, and as you said, you know, uh, there was no way that we could negotiate with all of those creditors and uh, at a reasonable level. Uh, we couldn't do it formally uh, because he didn't know what cash he was going to have to offer in a in a VA or a, or a do, in a VA in a docker scenario. Mm -hmm. And there was too much debt there for the small business restructure. Um, so for, for a business in this sort of situation, then what we can offer and what, what is available is a business restructure right? Um, compared to a debt restructure. So business restructure um, is, you know, for everyone out there, most people will know it as a version of a Phoenix. Um, and, and Phoenix, we don't shy away from it. It is a Phoenix, but there is a difference in the Australian market between a legal Phoenix and an illegal phoenix. There's a lot of getting the L's right there to make sure you hear the difference. But um, uh, so, so we recommended that we look at doing a, uh, a business restructure for him uh, to bring the business into a new entity and allow him to move forward that way. Hmm. So I think that's misunderstood. People hear the P word, they hear phoenix and thinks it's the devil, when really the government has acknowledged in legislation that when done the right way, and when done commercially, that uh, while it disadvantages some creditors of that company, it is completely legal and yep. it is considered to be beneficial to the economy and to society. Businesses keep trading, staff keep their jobs, and it's acknowledged that sometimes the need to uh, restructure a company or restructure a business is due to factors outside the owner's control. Yep. And I think in the coming months, we're gonna see a lot of that with the fallout from COVID-19. It's not like directors have done anything wrong. They haven't set out to, you know, gain an advantage over their competitors by doing this. It's, it's totally outside their control. So when we talk about there is a, a legal way to do a business restructure, Ashley, could yep. you just run us through some of the things that you need to look at when doing that? How do you do it? What's the process yep. look like? Yeah, sure. So the um, uh, again, this, this is a very high level, but we'll try and hit on the main points. The obviously um, the new company needs to be set up that's going to take on the uh, take on the business. Um, you, you, the continuation of the collecting of the debtors, particularly when you've got a debtor finance facility, um, which which uh, has the right to all of that money anyway. You want to keep control of all of that and move that forward, and even if it's not. You know, the best person to collect debtors is always the director of the company or its, or its staff. Yeah. Um, the, in terms of the actual transitioning of the business, the first and foremost thing that needs to happen is that there needs to be a valuation of the goodwill and a good, an evaluation of the plant and equipment. So the goodwill, you know, for a lot of micro businesses, if you take away the director, there may not actually be a lot, but on paper that still appears to be there's client lists, there's websites, all those things form part of the goodwill of the business. And for any business to take that over, then it needs to, there is a value to it that needs to be um, attributed to that. So we get valuations done um, and then prepare a sale agreement for that to be moved across to the new entity. But before any sale can go through, you've got to deal with all the registered uh, security interests that are in play. Mm. Um, so, you've, you know, you've got in, in Virat's case, we only had the debtor financier to deal with, uh, but in other cases, you do have banks and, and, uh, and often you have PIMSIs there for vehicles and all the rest of it. Uh, so you've got to manage those, get them on board, get them to deal with the, the changeover as well. Um, get you know, motor vehicle finance just needs to be assigned to the new entity. So that's getting on the phone to the finance companies and making that happen. Most are reasonably comfortable to do that. But again, the trick for players is knowing which ones will and which ones won't. Um, so that once, and then, and one of the other big things is the moving of um, websites, phone numbers. Um, it's amazing how many people forget that their phones um, are something that need to be transferred as well. So all of those little things need to be planned in the sale. Um, and, and go through. But probably the most important thing is once you determine the value and work out what needs to be moved across is that the new entity has to pay real cash consideration for the business. Mm. And that money must be paid back into the old company mm -hmm. um, because creditors should not be disadvantaged 
by the sale. So the, what, what the assets were worth and what a liquidator would get access to if it was liquidated that day must still be a, put it back into the business through the sale of the business. Hmm. Um, and that's, that's what turns it from a, a phoenix to a commercial necessity transaction. Yeah. So that's probably one of the key things there. In fact, some, I would consider, in, in my opinion, that doing a business restructure is probably going to get credit as a better return than that company simply going into liquidation. That the, the liquidators often find it extremely difficult to, to sell a business as with any element of goodwill in it. Uh, often the assets end up in, a, in an auction house like Gray's Online or Lloyd's or something like that. Again, and, and it's all sold at a fire sale price. Now, what you've been talking about, Ashley, is getting a goodwill valuation and a plant and equipment valuation at market value, not at auction value. Yep. So in that way, creditors are actually getting the best possible outcome under doing a restructure as opposed to going into liquidation. That's correct. Excellent. So, mate, time to press the button again and let's have a look at a few more numbers and see what happened with Virat. Now, in, in his case, the business and its assets valued at $50,000. Virat was able to borrow some money from family members and make payment to the company's bank account. The company was able to collect most of its debtors in the time that it continued to trade. And as you can see, those debtors have gone down to $30,000. And that was sufficient to pay out the debtor financier in full. So that debt's now nil. Now, as Ashley said earlier, you can't do a restructure without dealing with the security interests and the debtor financier had a security interest. So before the sale could proceed, that had to be paid out. Likewise, the motor vehicles were assigned over to a, a new company. The finance company agreed to that. And if you recall, there was, they were worth 130,000 and the debt was 125,000. So in addition to taking over the finance, there was another $5,000 deposited into the company's bank account to represent the equity uh, that was in those vehicles. So now as we can see, there's $145,000 worth of cash in the bank and there's another $30,000 of debtors there as well. So now that the company is often trading in the name of a new entity, this company is now ready for liquidation. So actually the company has some money left, as I said, in its bank account. It's got a few debtors. What should it do now? How would you deal with that? Yeah, so in, in these situations, there's a couple of ways that that can be dealt with, um, and, and none of them include the money going straight to the director. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the, the cash uh, that's in the bank account, it can either just be left there and we can put the company straight into liquidation and let the liquidator deal with it, um, or we can look to pay it out in the same way the liquidator would as well. So, uh, you know, based on their priority and their positioning in liquidation scenario. So, there was some super to be paid, uh, which then would, so that could be paid as a priority, and that would not create any preference or any any type of issues there. Uh, and then the rest would have to be distributed on an on an even basis. Everyone got their fair share. Hmm. Um, for us in this situation, we actually believe that the best way to deal with it was to actually just put the company straight into liquidation yeah. and let the liquidator deal with all of the components. So after the liquidators collected what I'm sure will be a very reasonable and modest fee doing the job. It'll be, it'll be fair and reasonable. It'll be fair and reasonable. Uh, he then distributed whatever money was left over proportionately to all creditors. Yep. So now Virat's sold the goodwill and the assets of the business. He's trading in the name of a new entity. The staff have been re-employed. So they've kept their jobs. They're still getting paid. Mm. All of their employee entitlements have been taken over by the purchasing entity. Mm. So they've all been preserved. And that new entity is now able to trade without the burden of that insurmountable debt that, uh, that Virat was facing. Mm. Sounds good. What about Virat though? What's his What's his story? Yeah, well, it's not potentially quite as good, Phil. So, um, uh, and and again, because of uh, personal guarantees and all the rest of it, this is where it starts getting tricky, and the need to make sure that you look at both sides of the coin. Uh, now, in his case, we didn't have any. Uh, uh, we believe that 
the, the most of the super is going to get paid. So we weren't really worried about direct penalty notices for Virat. Mm -hmm. um, but most of all the rest of it was fairly much lodged on time. So he wasn't going to have any pay, any any issues from a direct penalty notice. But um, the loan and the overdraft with the major bank, the fintech loan, the government back loan, uh, all were claims that had personal guarantees. And we've also got uh, some of the trade creditors have got personal guarantees as well. Mm. Uh, so poor old Vera has got a bit of a road ahead of him personally because of some of those decisions that he made in that period. Um, now, I, I, it's, it's a whole another hour of talking about um, how you manage him personally and all of those things. One of the things may be that with the negotiating with all of these separate creditors or we may have to uh, take it further down the path towards a personal insolvency strategy. Uh, so we just need to play that out. But as I say, it's, that's all the strategy around managing him personally uh, would keep you and I entertained for, a, for another hour. And I'm not sure that um, everyone listening has got another hour of, uh, of intention with all of this stuff yet. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk to you for another hour, but I'm sure people have got lots going on in their busy lives. Better things to do. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Thanks for running through that, Ash, and, and well done with the new flash buttons, mate. Uh, oh, we're you're doing, doing all right, aren't we? Yeah, you're doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. So thanks for running through that, and I hope that our audience found that interesting today and that they can take some of the messages or the, the key take-homes that we've spoken about today and uh, help your clients avoid the sorts of situations that Virat found himself in. Because as we said earlier, if Virat had acted sooner, uh, he may have been able to achieve an even better outcome than he did and may have been more effective in dealing with his own personal situation, uh, which, as Ash and I said, we could talk about for another hour. Yep. So that's my bit, Ash. Any final words for us before we, we open the floor that's to questions? Yeah, so I think one of those things, and, you know, it, it's always great to be able to say hindsight's a wonderful thing. And, and if, if, Virat, if Virat had come to us, before he'd made some of these decisions around the extra loans and things that he'd got, um, his personal exposure may well have been significantly less than what we thought it would have been otherwise, or what it has become now. So the sooner that um, they can get the right advice and work out a plan, he was trying to keep his company alive. But a business restructure 12 months ago, uh, or eight months ago, before a lot of these extra loans and things came in place, would still have allowed him to get that fresh start, but without a lot of the uh, legacy issues that he's now facing. So, um, you know, we can't stress enough. It's, it's uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but when you when you see some of these warning signs and some of these issues, um, it's better to have a look at it earlier. And I like to call it the plan B. You know, we, we at Yong Reid, we've got a team of strategists all over the country who specialise in helping people in these situations. And we will sit down and provide a, a holistic, independent report, uh, a, a review of the situation and provide a written report that both the advisor and the, and the uh, director or client can have a look at at no obligational cost. Mm. So it's a fantastic way to look at what Plan B is um, because, as you said earlier, Phil, directors and owners of businesses are unbelievably optimistic um, and they're entrepreneurial. That's, that's what they are. And the other thing that we find, I find really interesting is the family connection that they, their business owners will not do anything to, to hurt their staff a lot of the time, um, especially in these smaller micro businesses because they treat them like family and they will hurt themselves financially and their families before they actually let others get hurt. Mm. Um, so I will open up the floor to questions. Now you can ask a question either by unmuting yourself, um, uh, putting it in the chat box or raising your hand and then we can organise things. Um, my lovely admin team have also just put up a webinar feedback. Um, apparently we all uh, we like to see how good or bad you think we are. So, <laughs> so please uh, fill in the poll. Uh, and if, any, if you have any questions, uh, jump in the chat or raise your hand and then we can work our way through uh, those, uh, any questions that may come up. 
It'd be appreciated if you get direct all questions to my friend Ashley. Hey, good on you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, Tegan no. Jansen has a question. All right, uh, Tegan is he's unmuted. I can't see all that. So, Tegan, ask away. Um, oh. um, sorry, my name's actually Lauren. I've just logged in under Tegan. But that's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> no problem, Lauren. Um, so, the director penalty notices will still apply to a director of a trustee company. Is that correct? If the if the business is operating through a trust. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. yep. That's correct. Now I've had we've had a client come to us recently, like a new client, and they've got eleven unlodged basses. Um, <laughs> it's a given they are going to get a director's penalty notice, isn't it? Once we lodge all this, like, is it a hit? Is it sort of a lack of the draw, or is it like a you will get one sort of thing? Look, I'd probably be more inclined to say it's you will get one. Yeah. Um, but the if the company in the, the the trust stays active, the timing of it could be quite. It's quite unusual sometimes. Um, once what what we are finding though with these lockdown director penalty notices is that once the company is put into liquidation, um, it, it does tend to come through then. Um, but I, I would think in a normal collection cycle, they will. You know, we've always seen them issue director penalty notices before they even go to a creditor stat demand mm. because they're actually trying to get people locked in uh, before mm. they go to wind up. So why, like, you know, these basses are dating back to, to June 2018, I think. Yep. Why have they not sort of, I mean, it's like that, what you said before, the ATO has got no consistency with the way they chase. I mean, they they haven't paid a cent of super for their employees. No POYG has been paid. They haven't yep. registered a single touch payroll. Like you name it, everything that they should be doing, they're not doing. Yeah. But yet, there's no correspondence, and it's us who's sort of saying, "Well, you should be doing all of this," yep. and you know. But are we, we're doing the right thing by helping them get up to date. But at the end of the day very unlikely they're going to be able to pay i think it's coming to about two hundred and seventy five thousand or or yeah. like we've estimated yeah. um but we need to get it up to date don't we to see where they sit is that well you know, what yeah look uh, if, if you're playing the pure you know letter of the law stuff the directors yeah. have a responsibility to report or, um under the corporations act Mm. So really, yes, as advisors, we need to say you need to bring it up to date. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes if you know that it's, if you, even if you're starting to do the calculation and it's looking like it's a uh, unsurmountable debt, then you may be better off just actually putting it straight into liquidation mm. um, before going through all that process. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that that direct penalty notice won't still come yeah. because with PAYG particularly, uh, obviously, if any staff lodge their group certificates, they could do some data matching there. Yeah. Um, but it, that's the other option. And I mean, I, I'd never advise not to lodge a form. But yeah, if you're in yeah. that situation and you're not likely to get through it, then you may be better off just uh, uh, putting it into liquidation straight away. Yeah, it's just Many trying to find that, yeah, that fine line between, well... We go do all this work for them. Are they even going to be able to pay us at the end of the day as well? So you know, I'd, I'd yeah. be highly recommending money and trust for that first. <laughs> yeah. They're not they're, they're not showing a lot of signs of compliance, are they? No, no, no. Yeah, no, that's all good. Yeah. Oh, look, the um, they're trying to get their zero up to date. There's about seven hundred un uncoded transactions, so that's the, <laughs> the first. Okay. The first yeah. Step. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah. In any event. Yeah. At some point, if they come to the attention of the ATO, the ATO have the ability to deem an assessment in any event. Yeah, yeah. And uh, guess which way they tend to err on the side of? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Too low or, or too much? Yeah. They certainly they deem and then issue direct penalty notices. On yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So we, you feel we're doing the right thing by because we're, we're taking the steps. We're saying please get your records up to date so we can at least see exactly where you sit and then, you know, yep. so we, that is a good first step. Mm, and then, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right. Yeah, and I, and I will say that, you know, you, you mentioned that they haven't paid super. Mm. The ATO are super aggressive, um, are going after super. 
So oh, I, I had a lady we know in. we've had a few. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've had a few well, and, even in the last so two years. Yeah. yeah, and so they should be. It's a form of payment to the staff, and they and the staff should get that. So yeah. I, I had a lady who had a business that failed. She had seventeen thousand owing on an integrated client account mm. and eighteen thousand in super. Mm. Um, uh, business had failed. Uh, she closed it down. Uh, she'd become a pensioner because she was quite sick from, from trying to work too hard. And we tried to talk about saying, look, you know, she's going to go bankrupt for 18 grand or 20 grand. And they mm. said, we can get rid of the integrated client account. We could manage mm. that, mm. but we can't not chase the super. Okay. Right. So they, they, are, they are very aggressive on that front. Mm. Mm. And then too, with the, um, the penalty, um, on top of it as well, because we've seen some coming through at like 120%. Um, so, yeah, they're yeah. not, yeah, they're not sort of, yeah. yeah, not, we, yeah since the embassy's passed too. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we've just had another client come to us who had an audit of their, just their GST and yeah. they've hit them with a 75% fine on top of the uh, readjusted BAS. Wow. So they're, um, they're certainly... Uh, what type of stuff. errors were they, but were they like... Oh, well, I won't go into detail. He probably deserved okay. a, a fine. Right. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. No problem. Um, any other questions out there? Uh, no other questions as far as I can see. Okay. Um, uh, Laura, obviously, if you uh, it would be remiss of me not to say, if you want to give me a call afterwards, we can talk about what options we have for that client. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all good. Let me, um, yeah, let me go through the motions with them, and yeah, I'll definitely keep you on the list. No worries. No problem. Thanks, hey. Ashley. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I guess I'll just finish up by saying that our uh, a team across the country are very keen to help everyone. Uh, and help anyone who needs that help. So if you have any questions, you know, a situation like Laura where you just want to understand what the likelihoods or possibilities are, please pick up the phone to your strategist uh, around the country or to myself or Phil. Um, and uh, just we're, we're here as a support to you as much as we are wanting to obviously do the work for the clients. We see that as an integral part of... of um, of what we do is to be that support person and to provide you some guidance where needed. So um, if there, um, and I should say, uh, not only our strategists, but we also have our strategic partnership managers. Um, I notice Ross is there um, and, and Kate in Melbourne as well. So uh, please feel free to give any of us a call. We're more than happy to help. Uh, appreciate you all coming on again today. And I look forward, uh, and thank you, Phil, for, um, you, for the show and we uh, look forward to seeing you all next month if not before thanks very thank much thank you everyone